is uh, Vincent Martin. I'm the uh, director of the Office of Innovation, and I'm, uh, I have the privilege to be your moderator today. But first and foremost, let me share a secret with you concerning me. But it's not embarrassing, don't, don't worry. <laughs> Just a small secret. I've been in, in the United Nations for 25 years. And I will, I, will soon have my, yeah, I will soon have my medal of the 25 years celebrating this. I don't know if I should celebrate or... <laughs> I'm getting old. But, um, and among these 25 years, 22 in FAO. And I can tell you, I've never seen this level of energy, this creativity, the youth together, empowered to exchange solutions. This is really the first time I see that, considering that I just came back to FAO seven months ago and I was in the field for many, many years. I have never seen this level of energy and creativity and innovation. So I think it's important that we celebrate it and we recognize that uh, FAO has changed drastically. FAO has entered a new era of innovation, of embracing innovation and science. And I think uh, I will ask the Director General not to listen to me now, but I think it's thanks to the vision of a man. It's thanks to the vision shared by his core leadership to embrace innovation. It is thanks to his man who is here, who has created the first science and innovation strategy of FAO, first ever science and innovation strategy. So I think we are, yeah. <laughs> And by doing so, by doing so, we have created in FAO a safe space for innovating, for innovation, a safe space for taking risks, a safe space for celebrating successes, but also for celebrating failures. Not failures just for celebrating failures, but failures for accelerating learning, to innovate faster, and this idea of innovate forward. And when I think of risks, we have taken risks today, organizing this session. I'm going to tell you why. I'm going to introduce you a box, <laughs> this box, <laughs> from which some speakers will emerge. I, I don't know, I mean, who is familiar with that? Raising hands. Do you know what it is? It's just for the logo, possibly, but maybe not. So we are taking the risk of having two great inspirational speakers that will get here. But at the end, that's why I, I want to keep you in the room. So <laughs> they were just, and then if it doesn't work, if the technology fails us, then my boss will be really, really unhappy with me. <laughs> it's a risk, risk of failure. So that's why I'm, I'm, I'm saying at the beginning. <laughs> So this is innovation is taking risk, is embracing the future. Innovation is also, it's about anticipation. It's about leading from the emerging future. I like this expression because all the people you are going to see on stage are people who are leading from the emerging future. They are projecting themselves in the best future we can imagine. And then they are saying, what can we do today to have really an impact on tomorrow's future? Innovation is also a mindset. It's about removing the barriers of different nature. It's about thinking in terms of solutions rather than problems. Inspiring others through our actions. And we heard it during the first session, action is so important. It's not about a rhetorical question, rhetorical question we want to answer. It's about actions. It's about, I dare to say, it, being optimistic about the future even sometimes, everything tells you the contrary. And this is what we will do today, to shine a powerful light on these solutions and share inspiring stories, stories of those who are driving change. Each of the individuals you will be hearing from is passionately dedicated to applying their expertise and insights across various domains to a to uncover the creative and effective answers to complex issues. In our rapidly changing world, we require more of these visionaries 
more innovative ideas, all interconnected and serving as a wellspring of inspiration. Throughout the, throughout the remainder of the, of the week, we'll have more than a dozen more sessions. Among many other things, we will learn how to foster climate smart innovations for small scale producers. We will celebrate the leadership of indigenous youth, recognizing their substantial contributions in the realm of science and innovation for climate change and food systems. And their involvement highlights the richness, richness of diverse perspectives and knowledge. We'll have a chance to kick off uh, this meeting, of course, with the opening remarks of our Director General, but then we'll have also the perspective from two government leaders, one from Rwanda, one from Cameroon, and they will tell us what is their perspective in terms of innovation, what are the barriers, what are the challenges they are facing today. We will also have great panelists and experts. Uh, we will kick off with uh, Christina Gravert. She will be delving into the intersection of behavioral science and technology in sustaining in sustainable living. And then Cicelo Dube, am I right? I'm, I'm pronouncing it right, yeah, from Zimbabwe. She's a Mandela Washington Fellow and STEM, Science, Technology, Engineering and Mathematics Advocate. She will follow highlighting his uh, work in youth engagement and education. And then we'll have Luis Adaime, founder and CEO of Most Earth, who will discuss environmental solutions for carbon emissions of setting. And then Caroline Bousset, CEO of NADAR, specialized in forest carbon monitoring for conservation. And then we will have uh, you know, the cherry on the cake, our holograms. Uh, Dr. She Yen, she is a pioneer of China's communities supported agriculture, and she will shed light on integrating innovation into agriculture. And finally, we'll have Navi Raju, who is an innovation thinker. He will explore frugal innovation and jugal innovation for resilient agri-food systems. And you can find their bios in the chat box. So we didn't uh, put them on, on any screen, but you'll find the bio on the, on the chat box. And uh, my last word will be to say, let's use this forum as a catalyst for change. I encourage all of you to engage in discussions, question, collaborate, and most importantly, innovate. Together, we have the power to transform agri-food systems for the better. Let us shine a light on these solutions and work together to make a lasting impact. And with these words, I would like to welcome our Director General for his welcoming remarks. Director General, you have the floor. Thank you, Marty. I know you have uh, 25 years, but I only have uh, maximum eight years in EFL. I said four years ago, 9th of September 2019, informal meeting with all the ambassadors, permanent representatives to FL. I will use the one year equal four year. That's only the solution I can do. So times eight, 32 years. Now you can see I'm still keeping myself very energetic. I have 20 minutes, 30 minutes, I have a one meeting. From the early morning, wake up at the six until the 11. Yeah? So people need a science to guide your life. I'm a scientist. I always manage my life, manage my health. But it's a science. I had a lot of challenge questions to the WHO DG and the Chinese Minister of Health and others, Minister of Science, Technology. You know science, but you didn't apply science for your own. So first, most, I encourage all of you to learn in science, apply science for yourself first, for your family, for your community, for farmers, for the world. Yeah? That's a real deal. Otherwise, people only talk about science 
for bigger things. Yeah. Start yourself first. Believe science, apply science, and then encourage yourself in learning science. Dear colleagues, climate change is an agent existing threat. Global temperature are rising, that means hunger, inequality, and stability are also rising, especially for world most vulnerable people. Through many initiatives, that the leverage science, innovation, and technology effort is working with members and the partners to support the transformation of a global ecosystem so that they can be more efficient, more inclusive, and more sustainable to not only better address, adapt, and mitigate the impact of the climate crisis, but also be an integral part of the climate solutions. The new effort flagship agrophysics technology and the innovation outlook, the RTO, launched at this forum last year. It is a multiple stakeholder game changer that aims to select the best existing information on the current measurable science and technology and innovation to bet inform members in transformative potential of science, technology, and innovation available to them. This will be beneficial for evidence-based policy dialogue and decisions, including on investment. In response to the recent boom of the generative artificial intelligence, FOE has increased the internal capacity to better guide our stakeholders on AI capabilities and AI ethics. In terms of capability, FOE is supporting the developing countries in all the regions through the 100 1,000 digital value initiatives, which aims to equip the communities with the digital tools and service to fast track rural transformation and well-being. And the blockchain, for example, can help in fighting child labels in the coca sector. If it's working on that initiative through the new digital governance models designed for sustainable forestry. FAO office across the global also work with agro entrepreneurs, including the startups business, especially those led by the women and young people, so that they can leverage innovative technology to earn better livelihood. We are harnessing the potential of a biotechnology, which can support the innovative method for breeding and conserving climate resilient crops as well as biodiversity of local crops. This year, the Nobel already. It's for the MRA vaccine technology. So uh, it, it's indicated that it's all this cutting edge technology, especially bad technology, is so relevant to our life and the livelihood. In many countries, science, technology, and innovation has made a difference by making extension service and advisory more accessible to the farmers and the food producers. And also, I just had a meeting with the Minister of Rwanda. You know, Rwanda is a most densely populated country in Africa. But if we horizontally address the old challenges with a limited Arab land and also uh, territory, you have an, almost you have no solution. But with the creative ideas of design, new farming systems uh, vertically design and use his, his territory. And that's what be new solution for. That is why if we lead, promote, pilot, develop the implementation innovation policy level, and so policy is innovation also need to innovate in a way. Not only natural science best and the social science best, and also the position policy formulators, implementers, partners, and driving seeds of policy making to develop an inclusive policy, organizational innovation, remove barriers to the innovation think different way that's a start to the innovation a lot of people think always they follow the the routine way so if you think a little bit look at all the uh, design right He's, and martin proposed that box the pandora box or it's an alibaba box <laughs> but we have a tolerance uh, to the risk anything because we are innovative and knowledge based organization so I never complain my colleagues made a mistake in purpose. Yeah. If we are in purpose make a mistake, oh, it's another story. But unconsciously try your best, avoid any mistakes. 
I have enough authorities because I was a scientist. Yeah, I never blamed my colleagues and made a mistake. Yeah. Dear colleagues and friends, I look forward to hearing from the interdisciplinary panel of experts who will discuss innovation in various areas, ranging from remote science, behavioral science, and fair innovations. I invite all your engagement, ideas, argument, and the debate, but not the fighting. Eh? We are not allowed to fight in the FAO, but you can debate. Yeah? And also to, smiling nicely, not the criticize too much. We need the critical ideas, but not to criticize each other. <laughs> that's the, that's the uh, 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 diplomacy yeah? for the scientists and science cycles. Our action today will determine the state of our planet tomorrow. Let's ensure that we tap into the full potential of science, technology, and innovation to turn the tide on the climate crisis for the four betters by the production, by the nutrition, and by the environment, and by life, leaving no one behind. Science, it should be work where you believe and you apply. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Director General, a true champion of, uh, of innovation. And I hope this box is not a Pandora box, but better Naribaba box. <laughs> we'll, we'll see later, we'll see later. Now, I would like to invite uh, uh, His Excellency, the Minister of uh, Agriculture and Natural Resources in Rwanda. And uh, I would like to invite him on the stage to deliver his um, <laughs> remarks. Director General FAO, uh, queued on you, distinguished guests, all protocol observed, uh, ladies and gentlemen, a very good afternoon. I'm honored to stand before you and to be part of this discussion at uh, the FAO Science and Innovation Forum 2023 under the theme Science and Innovation for Climate Action. Let me first of all thank, express my heartfelt, heartfelt appreciation to Dr. Q for his invitation and uh, the opportunity to speak today. Uh, this forum is a pivotal platform to explore essential role that science and innovation play in fostering climate resilience uh, within the food systems. We are all aware that climate change is one of the most pressing challenge, challenges of our era. It affects every layer of our economies and its impact is profoundly felt on African continent. We face a range of climate disasters from relentless drought to devastating floods, which in turn results in significant losses, including reduced crop yields, livestock losses, and soaring food prices. As of today, 36% of Africa's population around 40, 460 million people are exposed to various forms of climate hazards, including droughts, heat waves, water stress, and floods. And by 2050, this number could increase to 45%, affecting 900 million people in a two degree Celsius warming scenario if measures are not taken. The World Bank estimate it's meant that the annual cost of climate change on Africa's agri-food systems will be roughly $200 billion a year, which is more than 10 times the cost of acting now to adapt. Ladies and gentlemen, I believe that science, uh, technology, and innovation, along with the strategic financing, are one of the solutions to curb the negative impact of climate change. In agriculture, 
we have some promising solutions at our disposal. Climate Smart Agriculture offers an avenue to bolster resilience, enhance productivity, and reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Examples of climate smart agriculture practices include conservation agriculture, which leads to minimal soil disturbance and preserve soil health. In Rwanda, with support from the one our esteemed partners bridge to Rwanda, we began implementing conservation agriculture in 2022, inspired by its success in other countries. Today, 5,400 demonstration plots are established and the full-scale adoption is anticipated. Our arsenal to improve climate resilience is also, also includes water index insurance products, which protects smallholder farmers from the ever-present climate-related risks they face. In Rwanda, in collaboration with the Rhineland Fires Ministry of Agriculture in Germany, we are also exploring digital information systems that support agri-meteorology digitization for climate adaptation. Precise and timely weather data improves farmers to make, empowers farmers to make sustainable decisions, reduces their vulnerability to climate-related risks and minimize farm ecological footprint. We are also developing drought tolerant seeds in maize varieties and disease tolerant cassava. We have also passed the biosafety law that will regulate the joint family defined organ research and development and the commercialization as a measure to create an enabling environment for creation and adaptation of technological solutions. Ladies and gentlemen, there is a compelling need to improve water management programs. More land in Africa is now getting irrigated compared to how it was 20, in 2015. Currently, in East Africa, the land being irrigated has increased by 70% since 2015. Rwanda's irrigation technologies play a pivotal role in addressing the challenges posed by climate change in agriculture, particularly prolonged drought. Innovative technologies like a solar power irrigation is also in use to offer a sustainable and environmentally friendly solution to support agriculture. We have also directed effort towards continued creation and maintenance of terraces because it has been found to minimize soil erosion and sustain soil health and fertility. Agroforestry is another measure we have adopted. For example, through FO support, we have planted 18,000 fruit trees and we are planting, planning to scale up by planting 21,000 more fruit trees this year. This practice has improved soil health, food availability, and the farmer's income. I may not even forget today's uh, advice I received from the DG, uh, Dr. Q Donju, that we need to do intercrop and the vertical agriculture to face the challenge of land scarcity in Rwanda, which is coupled with the population growth. And I thank you for that. This is a very good hint we add to our innovations in the agriculture sector. And this will allow us to not to leave you no know, one behind because this practice will be mostly adopted by the smallholder farmers who are more than 90% of our agriculturists. Ladies and gentlemen, for Africa, implementing climate smart agriculture is no longer optional, but a necessity. As we promote climate smart solutions, we must recognize that breeding resilience requires access to resources such as finance, digital communication, sustainable agriculture mechanization, and affordable and inclusive agriculture finance insurance packages, among others. Take the example of mechanization, for example. We use the use of sustainable mechanization in agriculture in Africa remains relatively low compared to other continents. 65% of farms depend on human labor. 
and only 20% are power engineered. They only use mechanization. This calls for more investment and adoption of inclusive agriculture, innovations, and technologies. As we move forward, Rwanda is developing a national strategic plan where we recognize that we are moving into an era where the fusion of science, innovation, and technology are a key to development and adoption of sustainable climate smart solutions that will ensure food security for all. Ladies and gentlemen, as I close, allow me to reiterate that in order to realize the ambition 2030 goals in the agenda for sustainable development, we need collective effort to seize the numerous opportunities that science and innovation offer to expedite the transformation of our agri-food system. I extend my appreciation to the organizers of this important event and to you participants who made it uh, for your attention and your unwavering commitment to driving positive change. I thank you very much and I wish you a blessed evening. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Excellency Minister um, of Agriculture in, in Rwanda for your insights and um, sharing with us a roadmap of innovation, science and innovation in, uh, in Rwanda. And you know you can count on us, you can count on the uh, Office of Innovation, on the Chief Scientist Office to accompany you in this, um, in this journey. Um, thank you again. I would like now to invite Christina uh, Gravert. Uh, she's Associate Professor in Economics and Co-Founder of Impactfully a consultancy that aims to create impact through behavioral science. Christina will discuss the behavioral barri barriers to climate change action and how behavioral science is used to overcome them, fostering engagement by individuals, communities, and governments to tackle climate change. Christina, you have the floor. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the invitation to speak today. We've already heard a lot about the importance of technology and about innovation, but as the Director General has already pointed out, in the end, it comes down to the individual people because the people are the ones who use the technology and the people are the end consumers, the products that are created by using the technology um, and all our consumption choices we make every single day. So what I want to talk about today is the role of these individuals and how we can think about using behavioral science in order to design policies that make it easier for individuals to reach their climate goals so that we can bring technology and individual action together. So we already know a lot about what we could be doing. We heard earlier today that there's been plenty of reports written about great, lots of great solutions. We know for individuals, what we should be doing uh, on our own to um, um, help with the climate change action. But generally, we're still not seeing enough. So what are the potential barriers that we have when it comes to changing behavior? Individuals might not change or might not act on climate change because, and this is maybe hard to say, but because they maybe simply don't care. Maybe there's just something that is not in their choice set and they don't care about this particular issue because it doesn't relate to them. So that could be one group. And of course, this is a group where behavior is going to be hard to, hard to change. But then we have another group and these people, they, they care, they do want to do something, but they not, might not know how. And I think this is often where policy tries to come in, where we say, okay, we need to teach people how to do it. We need to do trainings of farmers. We need to educate people. We need to let them know how important it is and how, why they should change. And that's good, but that's still not going to get us the full way. Then we might have another group of people. They care. They also know what they should be doing, but they don't have the means to change. They might not yet have access to the technology. We we're talking about data earlier today. If we think about 
telling people to take a bicycle instead of a car. Well, if there's no car, uh, if there's no bicycle pass, then maybe that's not, not feasible. So here we can think about what types of policies do we need to empower these people who care, who know how to change, but don't have the means to change. And then lastly, we have a group, and that's what I'm mostly interested in when I conduct my own research, is a group of people who care, who know how to change, who have the means to change, but I'm calling them here a bit biased in the sense that they get off track. They have good intentions, they, they want to do the right thing, but there are things in their daily lives that's getting in their ways and that's getting them off track. So now before we say, okay, there's groups one, two, three, four, we're all in all of these groups because we're gonna be in a different group for different types of behavior. Some of us might already be great at eating vegetarian, plant-based food all the time, but take lots of short distance flights. Or we might be very careful in recycling, but then we create food waste after we have a party. So there might be situations for some of us where we don't really care about the outcome, or there might be other situations where we care, but we just have a hard time following through with our intentions. So I think that's uh, important to keep in mind that all of us uh, can be in these different groups, but then when we think about how we should make policies, we should think about in which situations, which policy is going to be the right thing and for which types of people. So when we talk about this being biased, so, so what gets off, what gets off, off track? There's lots of scientific research being done in different types of psychological motivations for, for getting off track. And this is what we call about these different types of thought patterns. Every day we make hundreds of decisions, different types of consumption decisions, decisions on how to maybe use technology and science. Um, but we might be caring more about the present moment compared to long term benefits. Or we might be mindlessly copying what somebody else is doing just because we weren't really thinking about it and we're thinking about other things at the same time. Or we might be attached to the status quo, so we might be afraid to take a chance on something new because we're not sure what the outcome will be and that would be loss aversion. But all these different types of biases and heuristics can sometimes get us off track of our good intentions. Because even though now we're sitting here and we're thinking about climate change and climate change action, when we are in our daily lives, there's other things we think about. We have kids and maybe we need to call the plumber because something in the house isn't working. And there's so many things that can affect us where our attention is in other, on other things than maybe doing the right thing at the right time. So what we wanna do is to think about how can we make it easier for people to do the right thing even if they are distracted or if they're doing other things. So for those who have the right intentions, how can we think about closing what I call the intention to action gap? So this idea of I, I, I care about something, I know how, I'm, uh, how I should change, I have the means to change, but somehow this last piece in the puzzle is missing. And that's really where behavioral science comes in. And some of you might have heard the word of nudging, which is really just the word of applying behavioral science to policy making. So understanding these insights, what we have from science, what we know about human behavior, and then designing policies that make it easier for people to bridge these gaps between uh, their good intentions and actions and understanding how um, we or how our understanding of psychology can help to bridge these gaps. So how would we do that in practice? Um, when we work with this in a sci on a scientific basis is that we use a scientific process. So I hear often today science being talked about, about technological innovation, and that's of course true. But there's also a lot of science that goes into thinking about how we design policies and how we get individual people to change. So what we, I'll briefly walk you through this process of how I would work and how many organizations now work with changing behavior. So the first thing we need to do is to think about what is actually the behavior we want to change. So not just a general goal that we want to reach, but what are the individual's behaviors that get us there? The different adaptation of technology, for example. And then the next stage, and this is where the science really comes in, we want to understand what are the obstacles to change? Is it that people aren't paying attention? Is it that they don't have the knowledge? Is it that they're doing what somebody else is already doing? Um, so here we want to really 
dive deep and understand what, what are the actions and not already assume that we know the right answer. And then we can jump to the next point, which is then about outlining, so coming up with solutions, thinking about different policies. But if we've done step two, then we can be much better at creating the right solutions that actually target the problems that we have over here. And then, obviously, as a scientist standing up here, my favorite part, the idea of, of testing what works. So conducting studies, doing randomized controlled trials, ex doing experiments, where we actually then test different policies to see if they actually have an impact on the behavior that we had defined in the first step. And then after we've done that, we can then think about tailoring this up, thinking, is it really worth it, the cost benefits? So is this um, idea we have, is that really giving us the impact that we had intended? I think sometimes, and of course we said we should, should be nice and not, not criticize too much, but what I often see happening is that we have a general problem and then we jump here and come up with some type of solution, but without actually addressing whether that's really the problem that's going on, that's stopping people, right? We can develop an app create a website, make some, some, some nice technological solution, but if that's not really addressing the problem, um, then we might be spending a lot of time and money on things that are not actually gonna have an impact. So luckily, since around 2010, when the UK government introduced the Behavioral Insights Team, this was the first governmental unit that actually thought about how can we integrate insights from behavioral science, from psychology, into policymaking and use that to help people reach their goals and in a global, uh, bigger sense, of course, also towards climate change. We've really seen a lot of action also in different types of uh, international organizations. Of course, the United Nations being one of the leaders in this field. Um, here I've just put up some of the different uh, sustainable development goals that um, have been addressed using different projects, using behavioral insights by the United Nations. Um, the Food and Agriculture Organization here, of course, also has a great team implementing behavioral science and adding that uh, to to promote the goals. In my own work, I've worked on decreasing food waste in households, increasing public transport usage, medication adherence in pregnant women in South Africa, um, in getting more people to choose vegetarian options versus meat, um, different types of areas. Currently, I'm working on a large project on green electricity usage in Denmark. But I actually just want to highlight one of the projects that has been done here at the FAO, um, a project done with farmers in Ghana, because I think it shows really nicely this co-creation process, uh, where it was a uh, situation that uh, they knew they were supposed to use disinfected foot baths um, on the farms, and they also had the, the means uh, to buy the disinfectant and to use it, but somehow they weren't using it in their everyday lives. And then there was a question, it wasn't that they didn't understand that this was important, but in the busy day-to-day -day lives, this sometimes got forgotten. Um, or they maybe didn't really know how much fertilizer use uh, or in disinfectant use, uh, um, disinfectant to use in one point of time. So what the team then did is to think about, well, how can we make it easier? Not tell them again that it's really important, but to think about how can we strategically place reminders in a way that they will think thinking about it at the right point of time? Or how can they maybe use the bottle cap uh, from the disinfectant bottle in order to know how much fertilizer, uh, how much disinfectant to use? Disinfectant. So I think this is really a great solution because it's not a gigantic new technology. I mean, the, the bottle caps were already there and having reminders uh, set up at the right point in time uh, is also not something that we couldn't have thought of before. But it's a nice example because it exactly addresses the problem that was there and to remind them to do the right thing at the right time. So I think to close, what I want to say is that we really need to think about how can we embrace this idea of using behavioral science and making that part of the whole scientific process when we design policies uh, so that we can reach our climate goals. I don't think we have the time to implement ineffective policies, so this idea of using a scientific process to test policies and how humans will react to them um, is going to help us in a long way of, of reaching our goals. So now I think we know what we need to do, so now we just need to start to implement that for climate change action and a better future. Thank you.
Thank you so much, uh, Christina, for your insights on behavioral science. We don't have time to implement ineffective policies. I think that was quite clear. And this is what behavioral science can bring us, understanding what is the right policy at the right place so that we can make a change. Thank you so much for uh, your insights. And now I would like to invite uh, Cicelo Dube, who is a founder of the Elevate Trust, Youth STEM in Zimbabwe. Uh, Cicelo will explore the impact of early STEM exposure on children's climate change understanding and their potential as future innovators. Thank you. Most of my job has been done. The director and the minister were very clear that there is need for science to be part of each and everything that we do in our lives. Christina has made it even easier for me. She set the foundation that is a mindset game, right? So, of course, we have to talk about the power of early STEM education. We need to catch them young. Catch them young change their mindset, let them think differently, and we can apply what we're learning every day in class to apply to our community to create the environment that we want. I'm Sikelo Dube, passionately known as the STEM lady, passionate about science, technology, engineering, and maths, education, innovation, and entrepreneurship. It is projected by the UN population survey that half of the 54 nations of Africa's population will double by 2050. Great news, right? Fertility rate is high. Great news, mortality rate is low. But is it really great news for our environment? There'll be pressure on water, there'll be pressure on the land. Are we ready? And I have a solution. Yes, we can be ready if we empower the young people. We want to catch them young, right? We want to make sure that our students, when they are learning in class, they are thinking of how to apply this in the community. At the moment, so much work is being done in terms of conservation. The minister was talking about planting trees in Rwanda. We're planting these trees for the young people. The youth are the future. But if these young people do not know how to take care of the environment, they will not water these trees. They will cut down these trees. They will use them as playing sticks in the playground. We're talking about gene editing. We are saying for us to have better and fortified food for nutrition advancement to strengthen the food systems, we need science. We need someone to understand that they need to eat this yellow maize. This yellow maize is better than the white maize. Who's going to teach them that? We need to teach the students now. We need to catch them young. We need more students embarking on STEM careers, especially the girl child, because if you empower the girl child, you empower the nation. That is why I am the STEM lady, and I stand for that. I founded Elevate Trust at the age of 23 because I wanted to serve the nation. I'm a very passionate Zimbabwean. Don't ask me about a lot of things in my country, but I'll tell you that I stand for the private sector that wants to work to empower the young people to take up STEM education and change our country. We have the following initiatives at Elevate Trust where the innovators have clubs. These are clubs in our schools, and they can be in your school in your country as well. The curriculum is already so packed, the students can't take up all the things they are learning. The teachers can't take up all the modules they are supposed to teach. But we need the extra activities after school, and these are the clubs. These are the clubs where they bring their science to action. They are called the Innovator Sub-Clubs. I'm happy to share the curriculum and have Africa boasting of having Innovator Sub-Clubs in every school, in every community, to solve problems using science and technology, solve problems in our community. We don't only stop there, we also commercialize this, and I'm happy that as far as there's so much being done in terms of supporting innovations from young people so that they start up. For us to have a better life, we are talking about prosperity, and we are talking about turning scientific ideas into products, taking science to the community, and creating jobs. The young people need to be involved in climate change. 
So today I want to tell you about Young and Green. Young and Green is a safe space for young people to come together and be taught a number of things. We have a few pillars. At Young and Green, we make sure that the young people are stewards of the environment. I've already said it. We can plant all the trees that we want to plant, but who's going to water them? Who's going to take care of them? We want young people as stewards. We're going to teach them about stewardship for the environment. It's not enough if they can't communicate the science. At the moment, so much is being done in terms of science, but it's a language that the layman cannot understand. It's a language that the grandparents in the community cannot understand. We want to teach them when they are young that what you are learning in class today is exactly this in the community. Let's link the two. There is this disconnect between what is the textbook and what is there in the field. So this will be science communication. We are going to have roadshows. We are going to teach the the young and the old on how to take off the environment, how to work towards mitigating issues around climate change. We are going to have a student startup summit as part of the program. And the student startup summit is for creating green innovations and green jobs. We want to talk about industrialization, right? Africa's population is growing and we need to feed our own. In feeding our own and industrializing Africa, are we thinking about the environment? This is what the student startup summit green jobs component is going to talk about. We're going to talk about industrialization at the same time serving the, clim the climate. And most important, we're going to train the teachers. Have you ever stopped to imagine a 60 year old teacher who is teaching the child today on environment and climate change? And the last time they were in the classroom is 20 years ago. Have you ever stopped to imagine the content that they are sharing to the student today looking at the 21st century that we're in. I challenge all of us here, policymakers, I challenge all of us here to go back and look at our budgets and put money on training our trainers, put money on training the educator. It all starts in the classroom. All of us here, we count our achievement by taking our children to school, right? Those trainers need to be trained. This is the only way we can have an active engagement of science and innovation combat all these problems that we're having in environment and climate change. So this is a broad call for everyone to join the Young and Green movement. Every country in Africa needs this movement. Every country needs to work together towards the future that we want. And as I conclude, I would like to challenge all of us to embrace the issues around STEM education, I would like all of us to actively involve the young people in the solution towards environment and climate change. Let us collaborate, transcending borders and sectors to expect it, the transformation of our agri food systems and to realize the objectives aligned in the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. In conclusion, the path to a sustainable and climate resilient future commences with the youth and the formidable power of science, innovation and technology. Together we can propel the climate solutions, we can safeguard our planet and secure a brighter future for all. Together we can propel future forward towards a sustainable world. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Shiselo. Your passion is contagious. I think you have convinced everybody that education is so important. Science communication is so important. Thank you so much. I, I think it was really fantastic. And now I would like to um, call to the, uh, to the stage uh, Luis Adeime, founder and CEO of Moss Earth, which is a global solution provider for climate action. Luis will share most novel approaches to a regenerative economy and climate action through carbon credits and technology. It will discuss their strategy for Amazon protection and carbon footprint offsetting, aiming for carbon neutrality. Luis, you have the floor. My, my mic fell. Should I use that one? Uh, yeah, you can use that. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I've had a bit of an accident here. <laughs> so, hello? Yeah. So, uh, hi, everyone. Buonasera. Um, I'm Luis Adaimi. I'm the CEO and founder of Moss.Earth. Moss.Earth is a Brazil-based uh, climate tech 
meaning that we use uh, technology to expedite and make more accurate uh, the development of conservation and reforestation projects in the Amazon forest. Um, I just would like for us all uh, to do a bit of an exercise, which is uh, try to imagine a room the size of you know, this plenary here, full of trees and you know, just come with me or follow my counting. We just lost around 10 rooms full of uh, trees in the Amazon forest. We absolutely must stop Amazon forest uh, deforestation. Um, so I'm going to begin here. Uh, all right. And there are many myths. I'm going to talk about myths and reality of you know, what happens in the Amazon. Uh, and then I'm going to talk about how we are using technology uh, to fight deforestation and therefore climate change. So um, most people think that fossil fuels are 100% of the problem of climate change, but it's actually 76%. There's 24% that comes from us, humanity, burning forests to produce food. So to raise cattle, to plant soy, to plant corn. Uh, and that means that even if we stop using oil and fossil fuels altogether, we'll still have that problem of deforestation to produce food. So it, it's, it's two separate problems, really, that we must tackle. It's not just one, only fossil fuels. Um, another myth is that um, Brazil, because of all its forests, doesn't really emit. Brazil is the fifth largest greenhouse gas emitter in the world. 70% of our emissions do not come from us using gasoline cars or burning coal to um, you know, uh, generate energy. 70% comes from us burning forests to raise cattle and plant soy and corn. Um, and people are not burning down the Amazon forest, you know, because they are evil or, you know, for logging or mining or urbanization. I think we all have somewhat of uh, an image that uh, we see on, on television all the time, you know, people cutting down the trees and stuff. That's not really what's happening in the Amazon. 90% of all Amazon forest deforestation comes from land use change, meaning burning for agribusiness. And you, if you look on Google Maps, I suggest you try to do that on your cell phone, and you zoom in on the Amazon forest, all deforestation is for agribusiness. Why do people burn the forest, you know, to uh, raise cattle and, and, and plant corn? But why do they burn it at all? Because the forested land is much cheaper than the deforested land. Of course, it should be the contrary. Uh, what happens is a lot of the Amazon, also contrary to what most people think, a lot of the Amazon is privately owned. In the military dictatorship in the 70s and 80s, uh, Brazil, the government donated a lot of land to uh, private individuals. So people nowadays, they buy forested land at $100, they burn it, and they resell for $500, uh, for people to raise cattle and plant soy. Uh, and they do this on a thousand hectares, they made $400,000. So there's a lot of easy money to be made from burning the Amazon forest. Um, and another myth and reality about carbon credits, uh, which is our field, uh, carbon credits are not necessarily from planting trees. It's not from carbon sequestration necessarily. Most of carbon credits from forestry comes from conserving the forest because conserving the forest, half of the weight of a tree is made of carbon. So when you preserve a large forest, you generate carbon credits because you're avoiding emissions. Remember that I said that 70% of Brazil's emissions comes from us burning uh, trees. When you burn a tree, 
the carbon that is stored in the cellulose molecules goes to the air as CO2 and CH4 methane. And 70% of our emissions comes from us burning our green treasure, uh, the Amazon forest. And the Amazon forest is not necessarily the lungs of the world. Uh, mature, that's a myth, mature forests like the Amazon, um, they don't, they sequester carbon during the day through photosynthesis, but they, you know, breathe at night. So all that carbon that is captured goes back to the, to the atmosphere. But the Amazon is sort of like the air conditioner or the climatizer for the world because it, it, it um, in a way, uh, it controls or helps to manage and stabilize climate in southern Brazil and in south of South America. And through, uh, you know, uh, the currents, the weather in Africa, in the Sahara, and therefore in southern Europe. So our weather here in Rome is indirectly controlled by the Amazon forest. And the Amazon forest, like I said, is more like the world's air conditioning rather than uh, the world's lungs. So what are we doing to try to uh, avoid this? We're setting up carbon credit projects. Well, what's the technology in there? First, the rationale for carbon credits. Remember that the people buy the forest at $100 per hectare and they burn it and they resell for $500. Well, if we protect via carbon credit project, we're going to be generating $100 per year per hectare. So the land value goes up a lot, right? If you have an asset that is $100 and it's generating $100 per year for 30 years, that asset's not going to stay at $100. It's going to go to something like $800. $1,000, and then the forested land is more expensive than the deforested land, and we stop deforestation. Uh, and RED works. RED means, you know, conservation projects for carbon credits. There's a lot of, you know, criticism in the media, in the Guardian, in the New Yorker, saying that RED doesn't work. It works. Uh, you know, against facts and data, there are no arguments, as we say. Um, as you can see, Countries in the dark green are countries that do not implement red and countries in light green are countries that do implement red and deforestation is lower for countries with red projects. Um, and this uh, for Brazil is a gigantic market um, and it's a gigantic market for countries with forests, which happen to be in the global south, you know, countries in Latin America, Africa, Southeast Asia. But the carbon credit system is very slow. It's very analog. It's very ancient. It hasn't really changed its technology in 20 years. People still measure trees with tape to measure the amount of carbon. This is in a time of artificial intelligence. If you look at the process of carbon credit generation, you have document diligence, the forestry inventory, which is measuring trees by tape, a manual audit, and the registry verification. This is all done by hand in times of ChatGPT and BARD and et cetera. It's, it's really incredible how much technology has reached. What we are doing is we set up, we consolidated Brazil's amazing databases to do what is called technically a, a DMRV, Digital Monitoring Reporting and Verification. So instead of um, measuring trees with tape like this guy is doing, we're doing it via satellite imaging, and we're monitoring all of the 6 million rural properties of Brazil in real time, and any data that is updated concerning the properties, deeds, the properties, characteristics, the properties, uh, legal uh, rights, etc., our system captures automatically. Um, we are also, uh, technically called vectorizing <laughs> rasters, meaning we're getting the satellite imaging, images and we are standardizing them so that they can be read all the six million at once or, or at the same time, instead of doing one at a time, which is obviously incredibly uh, inefficient. So this is a system that we have developed. It's already commercially available and uh, I'll be happy to take or I would like to take the opportunity here, speaking with decision makers from the world over, to please get in touch with us. We'd love to work with governments 
from you know other places than Brazil. Uh, and my message here is one of hope. We began you know by clapping hands to show how much the Amazon forest is getting burned, but there is hope. Carbon credits do work. We have seen uh, a very significant increase in value of the land and therefore decreasing deforestation from carbon credit uh, projects. And now using technology, we hope to make it uh, more accessible uh, to everyone in Brazil and the world over. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Luis. Fascinating presentation. Um, revisiting the myth of carbon credit and also providing a solution which could be applied in other parts of the world. It was really extremely interesting. And now I would like to call uh, to the stage uh, Caroline, Caroline Bousset, co-founder and CEO of uh, uh, Nadar. No, how do you say that? Nadar, no, 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 right. So Caroline will explain why reliable satellite monitoring is the key to effective forest conservation. Caroline, you have the floor. Thank you. Hi, I'm happy to be here today. We heard a lot about innovation and science in general. I want to deep dive a bit um, into the topic of how specific technologies like remote sensing and satellite data can help us better monitor our forests. So this is how forest data collection looked like in the 1960s. Basically, you walked through the forest by foot and had these huge devices or tools to measure the single trees. Now, let's fast forward 50 years. What do you think, like, think that forest data collection looks like today? I'm just kidding. This, this is the actual picture I want to show you. So this is what forest data collection looks like in Germany to this day. So in Germany, we really walk through the forest by foot. We measure the trees with these devices that look a bit more advanced than in the 1960s, but the principle remains the same. And then we note down these parameters on paper, because as Germans, of course, we love our paperwork. So what if we could measure all of these variables from space and receive a digital twin of all forests globally? This is actually already possible. So multiple forest parameters can be monitored with remote sensing and satellite data, from forest cover to disturbances such as wildfires, to the detection of tree species, as well as measuring or monitoring structural metrics such as height or density of the trees. One of the hottest, hottest topics right now, which we also just heard in the talk from Luis, is carbon offsetting. So to put it short, forest conservation or reforestation is financed by selling the carbon that is stored in the trees. But of course, first we need to know how much carbon is actually stored or sequestered in the trees to know how many carbon credits can actually be issued. And traditional carbon estimation is fully dependent on field data collection. So basically, you sample a few plots, like you can see here. You um, go into the field, measure the tree parameters, and then use equations to derive the carbon stock. So this approach, of course, as you can imagine, is very manual, very time consuming, and very costly. And it has a high level of uncertainty associated with it, because at the end, you're just measuring a very small portion of the trees. And even the field data collection itself can lead to various issues. So one key parameter, for example, in carbon estimation is the tree diameter, which is measured at breast height. But what if you have an irregularly shaped stem? Or what if your tree is located on a slope? If the field data team is not following the exact same instructions, the data you are building on may already be flawed. Another common issue we see in carbon estimation is actually the usage of outdated images. So this is a lush green forest in the year 2021. 
And this is the exact same forest just two years later. So the forest was extremely hit by bark beetles due to um, the large issue of uh, drought and high temperatures in recent years, for example, in Europe. Using the first image I showed you would have led to an overestimation of over 3,000 tons of carbon, resulting in carbon offsets that were never backed by actual carbon stored in the trees. So my point is that the current methods of carbon estimation are antiquated and need an urgent update. So what we at NADAR are working on is a fully digital way of carbon estimation. So we apply optical images to derive the single tree crowns as well as detect the tree species. And we use LiDAR data to get more 3D information also on the tree height. And this consistent approach allows us to move from carbon mapping to actual carbon monitoring as the same forest can be measured and monitored with the same method every single year. The images I just showed you were from a forest in Switzerland where we accurately estimated the carbon stock at the single tree level and helped a local forestry company to sell data-backed carbon offsets and then replant the trees in this forest with climate-adapted species. At NADAR, we support forest protection at multiple fronts. So we also specialize in deforestation detection. We have all seen these images of large-scale deforestation. But deforestation isn't always as easy to detect. Sorry. Trickier detect is actually small-scale degradation, such as illegal logging. So the images you can see here are from a forest in the Central African Republic. So in the first image, you can see the undisturbed forest. In the second, you can clearly see that logging has taken place. But then just a few months later, you cannot even detect the logging anymore as the canopy has regrown quickly or closed quickly. This implies that more near real-time monitoring is needed even to be able to detect degradation in tropical forests. And this image here from terrestrial LiDAR data from the Amazon rainforest highlights the complexity of such um, yeah, tropical canopy covers as it shows um, the multi-layers of the canopy. But this is actually not the only issue in forest monitoring. What if all your images look like this and are all covered by clouds? These images were taken from the Congo River Basin, one of the cloudiest regions on Earth. And cloud cover, of course, is a huge is issue in optical satellite images and hinders a real, near real-time forest monitoring. So that's where radar data can help us. So Basically, radar is a different technology to optical images that can kind of see through the clouds and also several canopy structures. And while optical images are like photographs, radar sensors send out a signal that then interacts with the, um, with the surface and characteristics like moisture and structure. But radar data is actually quite complex to process due to the vast data amounts. So you can imagine even one image can have up to 10 gigabytes of data, which is around um, 4,000 images just on your smartphone. So how can we address all of these issues in forest monitoring? At NADAR, we are working on an integrated deforestation monitoring system that combines all of these um, satellite data sources I just showed you and uses each of their specific advantages. So why is all of this relevant? Forests are crucial for life on Earth. They harbor biodiversity and act as natural carbon sinks. But they are vanishing at an unprecedented rate. And as we also just heard in the previous talk, agriculture is the number one driver of tropical deforestation. This is a shocking example from the Ivory Coast 
where most of the forest cover was actually lost due to cocoa plantations. So we need to find ways in which we can cut the ties between agriculture and deforestation. So at Nader, we don't, do not only perform monitoring, but we try to work on solutions to halt deforestation. One chance that we see and you might have heard of is the new EU deforestation regulation that aims at combat, combating exactly this commodity-driven deforestation. So what we at NADA are working on is a software where we can help companies track the com commodities and the related deforestation. And this is what you can see here. And we're currently working um, with several cocoa cooperatives to digitize each of their farms, directly trace them from the start, and then provide them with the data they need to prove that their farms are not leading to deforestation to even be able to comply in the, in the global market with this new regulation. So I want to end my talk with a quote. If you can't measure it, you can't improve it. So as a data scientist, of course, I believe in the power of data. And I believe that the decision of any organization should be grounded in credible data. And only by accurately monitoring the status of our forests, we can detect deforestation early on and prioritize the right areas for conservation to help protect our forests as well as safeguard the carbon that they store. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Caroline. It was also a fascinating presentation, how to use technologies and data uh, applied to current problems of uh, deforestation. Thank you so much. It was really, really great. So now, 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 I promised something, right? <laughs> but, <laughs> well, let's see if I'm going to be fired or, or not. <laughs> if something gets out of the box, we don't know. Um, but two things first. Well, first, I wanted to say while we are installing the, uh, this thing, uh, for that uh, to organize this session, it was really a, a teamwork. And uh, I've got all my team who is here, and they've done something incredible to be able to put that together, including the Xbox. I'm not going to name all the colleagues who've done that, but I want to give a special thank to Nicola, who uh, really helped us to bring that thing on stage. Thank you so much. But thanks to all the team, my team, who did, uh, who did this fantastic uh, job. The second thing is, um, so the first, uh, well, if it works, huh, right? <laughs> Sorry. <I'm laughs> uh, the first uh, um, kind of presentation uh, will be, uh, it, it has been registered. It has been recorded because uh, the person I invited, she's in China, she's a farmer. And, uh, and because of the time difference, it was easier uh, to recall the presentation than being with us uh, live. So we should hear uh, her, uh, but it's a, it's a video that was recorded. The second one is live, so we'll see if it really works, but the second one should be with us on stage. So, um, so we've heard all this incredible uh, innovation so far, uh, digital in all directions, how we can use innovations and technology. Now we are going to, to listen from a farmer. It's very important to listen to farmers because they are the ones who are innovating every day. Um, so I would like to invite, um, so is the uh, technology can work. So I would like to, uh, to invite Shuyen, Dr. Shuyen. Uh, she's, a, she's a farmer in China. I met her when I was the FAO representative in China. And uh, she's really the leader of agroecology, of the agroecological movement of community supported agriculture in China. And she's doing an incredible job there to promote uh, sustainable agricultural like, practices. And we would like to hear from her, what does she think about innovation and what are also the barriers and challenges for innovating when you are a farmer? So can I ask the, um, somebody to do something? <laughs> I don't know what. <laughs> My name is Shia. I'm the founder of Share Harvest CSA Farm located in Beijing. So CSA is short for Community Supported Agriculture. It's a global concept that means reconnect 
farmers with consumers directly. Uh, while I was doing my PhD in Renmin University of China, at that time, I have been to rural areas, many villages, several times. And at that time, I found there are actually many issues, including chemical use in the field and also the elder generations of peasants. Um, and uh, there are also food, other food issues like food waste. Uh, but I think the core issue for rural China is how we can have young generations of farmers going back to the rural, going back to the villages and be the link between uh, the villages and cities, between um, producers and the consumers and be the link, be the bridge. Um, so after I graduate with my PhD degree uh, with uh, uh, agriculture development, then I start my own farm, Share Harvest CSA Farm. At the beginning, our whole team were only eight people, but now our whole team, uh, there are about 80 people together. About half of them, we call them elder generations or traditional uh, peasants, who they were born in the village and always doing about agriculture uh, production. And uh, also half of our team, we can call them young farmers. Uh, these young farmers are not only doing about agriculture production, but also management, um, like customer service. And also we have several uh, young farmers. Uh, for example, one is doing bakery, uh, making bakery bread uh, for our members. So now uh, we'll share harvest is not only a farm, but also a community. Uh, well, at the same time, this, those 80 people, uh, we also link with the, uh, our national CSA network. It's about 1,500 CSA farmers all over China. So our farm are also linking with those farmers. We help them uh, to uh, sell their produce. And also every year we hosted a national CSA conference. And uh, already it, right now it's already uh, 14 uh, conferences uh, by the four, last, past 14 years. Um, be, by the, this conference, we are building a national CSA network. Uh, so uh, also there are uh, farmers, uh, other producers, consumers, scholars, um, and the supply chain people, and also um, government people. Uh, so it's like a, a national CSA movement now already happening in China. So for share harvest uh, itself, uh, right now, my farm, we have about 25 hectares of land, including about the whole year, we produce about uh, 100 varieties of organic vegetables and about 10 varieties of fruits. And we also have animals, we have cows, we have uh, chickens, we have some goats, some geese. Um, and all this, uh, all this produce, all these uh, animals or, or plants, become our biodiversity. So our farm also be recognized uh, by our, the, uh, our Ministry of Agriculture as a national uh, agroecology farm uh, this year. Uh, well, at the same time, uh, my farm also doing lots of trainings and also food education program for the city people uh, in Beijing. Uh, because you know, in Beijing, there are uh, uh, so many populations and all this, these people, they live in the city, they really need uh, to reconnect with nature. So uh, I think because in China, we have a long history, four, uh, four or five thousand years of farming history. So uh, it's, uh, we also trying to reconnect people with land. Um, so by doing a new farmer training uh, every, every month, we have new farmer training. We already hosted 51, uh, a new farmers training program. So the all uh, the people all over China, they can come to my farm and uh, 
five is a five day training program. They can leave and also get trained, also practice at the farm. Uh, it's like a beginner um, training program. And about uh, already there are 1,500 people get trained from our program. And about 30 of them, they already start their, um, their farm. And others also, uh, we're trying to make them uh, also a responsible consumers at the same time. And uh, every weekend, so we also have lots of food uh, educational programs for the kids. We go to schools and uh, the schools also organize students to come to the farm. Also adults, uh, many volunteers every, at the weekends, they want to come to the farm to work at the farm. Um, and so uh, my farm share harvest also trying to be, uh, you know, um, to be a place where uh, people can uh, can find agriculture multifunction um, at the farm. Um, well, at the same time, we are also trying to be a, you know, city, then CSA, uh, but most of CSAs are near cities. So how to help other smaller uh, farmers or peasants uh, to sell their organic produce. So we innovate a system called CSA plus PGS. PGS is participatory guarantee system. So each province, we have a CSA network. Then that network go to check uh, with farmers and then they can recommend the real uh, organically produced food to our national CSA network. So for example, my farm, uh, including my own produce, we can also sell other farms produce uh, so that like rice, like uh, other fruits, our members can all get from our own supply chain. So the second question is about how we can make this innovation be scalable. Uh, I think there we really need a systematic uh, innovation um, by produ uh, production side, also the supply chain, also the market, also uh, the consumer, uh, their behaviors, also the uh, policies. So first of all, I think education, trainings are very, very important because when uh, I found many of the uh, issues that are actually rec recognition um, or uh, consciousness uh, problems. So if we can increase the farmers about their techniques on uh, agriculture pro pro uh, production or the consumers, uh, their consciousness about how to eat, how to find healthy food. I think that will be uh, very important for the whole uh, whole, supply, uh, whole change, whole the innovation. And the second one is how we can make the farmers and also the consumers, uh, making them be more organized. Because when you are only a small farmer or a small peasant, it's very hard to be dialogue with the supply chain or the market. So the farmers, we really need to organize our, ourselves. That's why we are also right now trying to organize every province, uh, be a CSA cooperatives. And third one, also the most important one, is how we can make the policy be more beneficial to the people, to the uh, producer side, because they are, uh, I think 80% of our farmers are uh, also uh, still small farmers. So they, they really need to have, uh, have policies to support them. Uh, not, you know, not, uh, not uh, only the policies for the uh, capital company or, you know, the supermarket, the wholesale market, but most of the, uh, I think the support should be for the people, for the uh, producers and also uh, consumers, uh, and that will make all the, uh, so that if we uh, have more support for them, for the people, I think the whole change will be happened and, uh, uh, and uh, there will be more people, uh, they also want willing to join in this uh, new system. Uh, that's all, thank you very much. That was that was really, really impressive. Uh, we are running a little bit out of uh, time, so we are going to move to the 
uh, next presentation, uh, and I hope it will work also. So it will be uh, uh, Navi Raju who is going to introduce the concept of uh, frugal innovation, Jugad. Uh, so we are going to hear from him. Uh, I hope he can appear here. And then we'll have the closing remarks by uh, His Excellency the Minister of uh, Agriculture of Cameroon. Navi, can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you. Great. So I'm, I'm positioning myself first. <laughs> you're on stage. You can address us. Great. Thank you very much. Um, uh, so uh, let me begin with an interesting story. Um, in a remote Indian village, Mansuk Prachapati, a porter by training, has developed Miti Cool, a fridge made entirely of clay, it doesn't require electricity, and can keep fruits and vegetables fresh for several days. Prajapati didn't study science, but his clay fridge uses the scientific principle of evaporative cooling, which cools hair through water evaporation. This is an ingenious and sustainable solution that perfectly embodies the spirit of frugal innovation. Frugal innovation is a disruptive strategy that aims to do better with less. That is, to create simple but effective solutions that deliver more economic and social value while using fewer resources and polluting less. The FAO predicts that we need to increase global food production by 70% to feed 9 billion people by 2050. But at the same time, given the climate crisis, we need to significantly reduce the use of energy, water, and land needed to produce food and lower its carbon footprint. In other words, we must figure out how to produce and distribute more food using fewer resources. By adopting a frugal mindset, you as food scientists, technologists, and entrepreneurs can develop affordable and sustainable solutions to make global agri-food value chains more productive and climate friendly. If you want to become a frugal innovator, there are three proven principles you can follow. The first principle of frugal innovation is Keep it simple. Rather than over-engineer complex solutions, stick to the basics. Create simpler products and services that are easy to use, develop and maintain, and yet can have a big impact. For instance, studies show that in Rwanda and Burkina Faso, post-harvest losses for perishable products like tomatoes are as high as 60%. This is because farmers lack an affordable and simple storage solution to conserve their fruits and vegetables after harvesting them. A complex solution to this problem would be to install conventional cold chain facilities powered by electricity. But refrigerated cooling systems would be too expensive for small farmers, but also climate unfriendly as they use fossil fuels. What small farmers in Rwanda and Burkina Faso need is a simple cooling solution that can be built locally, is easy to use and maintain, and doesn't require electricity. Remember Mithikul, the clay fridge I mentioned earlier. It relies on the evaporation of water to create the cooling effect. Can we apply that same principle to address the cooling needs of African farmers? Yes, we can. The Horticulture Innovation Lab, funded by USAID and Agribusiness Associates, a development consultancy, worked with local scientists in Rwanda to develop what is called a zero energy cool chamber. Based on the evaporative cooling principle, this cooling chamber can be built cost effectively using just bricks and sand. It can store up to 16 crates of fresh produce. Thanks to these low-cost cooling chambers, today Rwandan farmers are able to significantly reduce spoilage of fruits and vegetables after harvest and increase the income. But you can go one step further. Michel Ferlu, a researcher at Ecole des Mines d'Alès, a top French engineering school, is working now with partners in Burkina Faso to develop a brick-walled cooler as big as a container. 
This solution offers significantly larger storage capacity and yet uses the same basic principle of evaporative cooling. So you see, you can create a frugal solution that is simple in design and yet big on impact. The second principle of frugal innovation is think and act horizontally. Companies, especially in agribusiness, tend to scale up vertically by centralizing operations in big factories and warehouses. But if you want to be agile and create local impact, you need to scale out horizontally the agri-food supply chain by decentralizing activities in small scale units. Today, across India, regional governments offer many financial incentives to local farmers to cultivate millets, which offer many health benefits and are environmentally friendly. Research shows that millets use 70% less water and 40% less energy than rice and grow in half the time of wheat. They also can survive extreme heat conditions. Millets are also more nutritious than rice as they are richer in fiber and lower on the glycemic index. Despite growing local demand, small farmers in India are reluctant to switch from rice to millet. The key reason is because they don't have access to the right equipment to process millets at a small scale. Selco is a social business that has set up off-grid solar power systems for one million households in remote Indian villages, hence boosting the rural economy. Just like a decentralized solar energy production, Selco decided to scale out the processing of millets. Specifically, he developed a whole range of solar powered equipment that small farmers can use to automate all steps in millet processing, from pre-cleaning and hulling to polishing and pulverizing. Today, hundreds of rural families in India are using Silco's frugal equipment to process millets and improve their livelihoods. The third principle of frugal innovation is leverage existing resources. Rather than reinvent the wheel, create more value from existing resources and assets that are widely available. These resources can be physical or immaterial. For instance, in India, EM3 Agri-Services is a business-to-business -business or B2B sharing platform that operates as an Uber for small farmers. It provides small farmers access to tractors and other farm equipment on demand on a pay per use basis. It also offers farmers consulting services in vital areas like sustainable crop management. This frugal and flexible service enables India's financially strapped farmers to produce better and earn more using fewer resources. Likewise, Farmers in India, Africa, and South America are using digital knowledge platforms like Digital Green to share agricultural best practices and innovations directly with each other. In summary, by keeping it simple, scaling out your operations, and leveraging existing resources, you can innovate frugally, create sustainable value for farmers, and feed properly 9 billion people in coming decades. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Navi. Can you still hear us? You are still here? He has disappeared. OK. <laughs> oh, he's here. I'm still here. I'm still here. <laughs> you are here. <laughs> it, wasn't a, it wasn't a vanishing act. <laughs> It's, it's, really, it's really extraordinary to, uh, to have you here. And uh, Navi also wanted, uh, didn't want also to, uh, to travel by, by plane. He want to be uh, to lesser his uh, environmental footprint, right? So uh, that's right. <laughs> so that, that's, I mean, that's, that's not very of, of, of frugal innovation, this box, but, uh, but definitely the fact that he can be with us without traveling, I think it's a, it's a great innovation. Uh, thank you so much, Navi. Just to say one word about the fact that uh, uh, FAO is going to embrace also this dimension of frugal innovation, simple innovation, keep it simple. I mean, this is something that uh, uh, 
we are embracing the whole spectrum of innovation from really high tech things to social innovation to uh, using behavioral sciences. But frugal innovation is extremely important for so many countries where we are providing support. So thank you so much, Navi. We need to, um, to go to the closing remarks because I think we are running a, lit a little bit late. So I'm going to invite the Minister of Agriculture and Natural Resources from Cameroon to give his closing remarks. Thank you very much. Thank you. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, I'm deeply honored to address you today in my capacity of Minister of Agriculture and Rural Development of Cameroon on a topic of immense importance. The crucial role of science, technology, and innovation in addressing the climate change challenges that impact our agri-food system. As a nation, Cameroon faces the dual responsibility of ensuring food security for our people while tackling the adverse effects of climate change. Our agri-food system are at the forefront of these challenges, bearing the brunt of uh, unpredictable weather patterns, soil degradation, and the loss of biodiversity. In this critical juncture, technology emerges as our strongest ally. Here are a few reasons why it is paramount. Climate smart agriculture, technology and innovation enable us to practice climate smart agriculture, a methodology that adapts to and adapts to and mitigates the effect of climate change. Sustainable resources management, efficient use of resources is essential for the agri-food sector with technology. We can precisely manage water resources reduce waste and enhance energy efficiency. Resilience building, climate resilience, crop varieties developed through technology and innovation can withstand extreme weather condition, ensuring food production, even in the face of adversity. Market access e-commerce platforms, mobile apps, and online marketplaces contact our farmers to a wider customer base. By embracing innovative technology, we can bridge the gap between producers and consumers. Data-driven decision-making, the power of big data allow us to gain deeper insights into agri-food system, predict emerging challenges, and formulate adaptive policies. Mesdames et Messieurs, distingués invités, alors que nous nous réunissons aujourd'hui, reconnaissons que la technologie et l'innovation ne sont pas de simples outils, mais des instruments puissants de changement. Elles nous permettent de renforcer la résilience de réduire les émissions et d'assurer la sécurité alimentaire de nos populations. Cependant, la technologie et l'innovation seules ne peuvent pas accomplir la transformation que nous recherchons. Nous devons favoriser la collaboration entre les gouvernements, le secteur privé, les institutions de recherche et la société civile. Ensemble, nous pouvons exploiter le potentiel de la technologie et de l'innovation pour créer un système agroalimentaire durable qui prospère face au changement climatique. En conclusion, je me tiens devant vous en tant que représentant du gouvernement camerounais, une nation engagée dans l'utilisation de la science, la technologie et l'innovation comme un moteur dans notre lutte contre le changement climatique. Le Cameroun aujourd'hui utilise l'innovation et la science pour disséminer rapidement de nouvelles variétés dans la production agricole. 
Ainsi, nous utilisons les vitraux plants pour produire la banane plantain et la banane douce. Nous utilisons la technique SA, s -E h pour produire les plants de manioc, d'abord à partir des boutures de racines, en passant par les serres et ensuite dans les champs. Et nous utilisons aussi la technique des boutures apicales racinées dans la pomme de terre pour la production rapide des semences. Je voudrais conclure en remerciant la FAO qui nous a, assist... qui nous a associés à cette grande cérémonie. Et je voudrais dire que notre engagement commun envers la science, la technologie, l'innovation et la durabilité nous conduisent vers un avenir plus radieux. Je voudrais terminer en remerciant toute l'équipe de la FAO et le DG Shudongyu. Merci pour votre aimable attention. Merci beaucoup. C'était super. Merci beaucoup, Monsieur le Ministre, pour vos remarques de clôture qui étaient excellentes. Thank you so much, Our Excellency and Minister of Agriculture. It was really fantastic to have your closing remarks. I'm not going to keep you more than that. Just to tell you that there is a fantastic exhibition on innovation behind the atrium. But uh, nobody's going there because it's a bit hidden. So whenever you want to, to visit the uh, exhibition, uh, either tonight or, or uh, uh, tomorrow morning, I think we really invite you to, to go there. You will see there are great innovations on display. Thank you so much. I hope you enjoyed this um, session as much as I enjoyed it. And uh, have a nice evening. Thank you so much. Thank you.